Welcome, guys, to How the Frack We Got Here, a show that takes the news and events of the week and try to make sense out of it all. I'm your host, and most will be again. And on this show, we simply are all about the facts. There are plenty, plenty, plenty of news stations out there that simply want to do anything short but inform you. Here at How the Frack We Got Here, that's all we believe in. We go up to the left, we go up to the right, we go up to the middle of the independence. We go up to all sides because there's more than one side of a story to everything. And you need to know it all in order to get the order, in order to actually formulate your own opinion. And that's what we try to do here. How the friend we got here. Thanks for listening. And um, hold on, it's gonna be fun. All right, guys. Today's date, June the fourth, twenty twenty two, and this is how the frack we got here. I'm your host, the most will be can on how the frack we got here. We do take the events of the week and try to make sense out of it all. Uh, before we get started, guys, we are a family friendly podcast, which we try to be. Uh, sometimes there may be things that might be shown that might be too intense for younger viewers. So, if your discretion is advised, aside from that, welcome. So, what do we have here on this weekend? Well, I keep on saying the whole entire time that maybe CRT needs to be taught in class because we've seen what happens when CRT, as far as cultural sensitivity, as far as cultural awareness, as far as just teaching people that there are other races besides the male ones out there. And you can tell because a child in Mississippi was given a monkey award. There are just some things you just can't make up. Awards that kids get in school can inspire pride in both the child and their parents. But one Mid-South mother says her pre-K son brought home the monkey award, a moment that left her asking questions. So she contacted Action News 5, and I started making phone calls down to Batesville, Mississippi, and the South Panola School District. Six days and several calls later, no response from anyone in charge. Now, the child's mother sat down with our Bria Bolden tonight, sharing her concerns about this so-called award bestowed upon her son. So, Bria, tell us what you've learned. Yeah, well, Joy, so far, I talked to the mother tonight, five-year-old Braylon Ellis's mother. She's angry. She's upset. And she wants more to be done. Now, more than a week after this happened, she told me she met with district officials who told her, yes, what happened was unacceptable, but the child's teacher didn't know the history behind African-Americans being compared to monkeys. So we wasn't happy about that. I'm still not happy about it. I'm angry because I don't understand why my son got the monkey award when he had received a award that he had completed pre-K. Shamika Ellis is looking for answers after her five-year-old son was given this award at the end of the school year. He received other awards too, but this one, comparing him to a monkey, is something Ellis didn't expect. What was his reaction? He about? was excited um, about the award, but he had no idea what he was holding. So, you know, it's unacceptable for me. She sent emails to school officials asking for an explanation, eventually meeting with the South Panola School District Superintendent and Batesville Elementary's principal. Um, she stated that the teacher stated that she gave him the award for his energy, but the, certificate, the award doesn't say anything about energy. It says entertainment. Ellis says they told her an animal-themed award ceremony had taken place in Braylon's class. She also says the principal told her school leaders had a meeting before this happened, cautioning them about awards given to students. You know, the awards, she stated she had a meeting with them, and she stated that they were not to pass out any awards that was going to be offensive or raise a red flag, but she did it, they did it anyway. Ellis says district officials told her her concerns should have been addressed immediately, and award ceremonies similar to this one will not happen anymore. Now she wants an apology from the district. So these teachers have messed up. They was wrong. The superintendent know they was wrong. The principal know they was wrong. So they need to be held accountable for what they have done. And after all of our unanswered calls to the district, we emailed Batesville Elementary's officials asking if this award is given out every year and if Braylon was the only child to receive the Monkey Award. As of tonight, we have not heard back from any school officials. In and, so, and the thing about it is, which honestly bugged me the most, that the first excuse that was given was that the teacher did not understand the cultural impacts of giving a black child an award that simplifies the monkey award. 
well, he has so much energy and all this. So you compared him to a monkey? And the thing that kills me about this, yes, this is in Mississippi, which, again, probably one of the worst states, because you got to remember, the almost damn near dead last in education, high in obesity, high in, high in obesity, morbid death rates. At the same time, that last, that first part, education. How in the world are you a teacher and you don't understand by giving a black child anything that symbolizes a monkey is not culturally insensitive? Didn't we not just get on H&M not too long ago about a shirt that where a kid said the coolest monkey in the jungle? Coolest monkey in the jungle was worn by a black kid. How did that, where, where's the red flags? And, and again, this is why I sit there and say that that's bullshit. That is utterly bullshit. Because anybody would have half a brain would have said that and said, wait a second, you're giving this out to black kids? You shouldn't. And even more so that the school itself seems to not be uh, so high and mighty about um, answering for this. Except, oh, well, we talked to the teachers and they weren't supposed to do this. So where's the where's the recourse? Will the teacher be reprimanded? Will the teacher, you know, be put through a cultural sensitivity course? And keep in mind, this is why this is the same group of people, the same states, heavily red states, who are who who put in laws to ban CRT teaching in schools even though CRT is not being taught in any schools, unless your kid's in law school. But again, we're seeing we're seeing the effects of a lack of cultural awareness, but the excuse is that she didn't know is not going to fly with educators. As educators, you should know. You are taught about teaching more than just male kids. You are taught to teach more than just the cultural you know, whitewashing, or at least doing it the right way and teaching history properly, so that kids actually have a better awareness and actually will hopefully not repeat the same mistakes as previous generations have done. But to basically excuse it all the way, that was messed up. But again, another reason why I say education is vital, but having the right teachers in there makes it all the more vital. Moving right along, guys, again, I hate to keep going back to the January 6th commission um, because it's still alive and running, and we are less than, we are three months and counting away for the midterms. So this little bit actually is very, very, very vital because again, this goes to show you an example on that crazy day, um, how many people knew, and even more importantly, how Dorito knew how bad he incited a mob, and again, a whole other reason why he should be held accountable for it. When it turned out to a CNN exclusive on the January 6th investigation, we know that an array of Republicans texted then White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows demanding that President Trump tell the mob storming the Capitol to stand down and go home. Now, our CNN special correspondent, Jamie Gangel, adds in conversations with more than a dozen of the people who were texting Meadows that day. Her reporting shows how angry even key Trump allies were with the president's refusal to speak out, and it shows how central Meadows was to the Trump effort to ignore the will of the voters. Jamie is back with us now. Tell us more. John, for the first time, we are releasing all of the key text messages from late on the night of January 5th through January 6th. What it shows is in real time, minute by minute, really the drama, the fear of people closest to Trump, allies uh, who are pleading with Meadows to get Trump to act, to speak out and to tell the rioters to go home. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. We put them all up on CNN.com so people can see the TikTok of the day. But just to start, from Republican Congressman Jeff Duncan, 3.04 p.m., POTUS needs to calm this, you can read it, down. From former Trump HHS Secretary Tom Price, POTUS should go on air and defuse this, extremely important. From North Carolina conservation lobbyist Tom Kors, this is someone who had worked with Meadows over the years on lobbying. Please have POTUS call this off at the Capitol, urge rioters to disperse. I pray to you. There are dozens of those, uh, John. For context, Meadows rarely replied. When he did, it was a couple of words, terse. Never do you see in his messages the emotion, the fear, that you see in people who are reaching out to him. And so you tried to fill in the blanks by talking to uh, more than a dozen people who were involved in those text exchanges. Uh, what did they tell you? So we've had these text messages for a while, but when I went back to look at them again, 
I decided to call the people who texted on January 6th. And it was very interesting. They all wanted to talk. Some people kept me on the phone for more than an hour. They said they were waiting for someone to call them. We reached out to former White House officials, Republican members of Congress, Trump supporters. And here is what's notable. Each and every one said they stood by their text. And each and every one said that they believe that if Trump had immediately spoken out, he could have stopped the attack. This goes to the committee's point of inaction, that he doesn't appear to do anything. So here are some of the quotes. The first is from Alyssa Farrar Griffin. She was Trump's director of strategic communications until December 2020. She is now a CNN political commentator. She put it very bluntly, quote, I thought the president could stop it and was the only person who could stop it. When he finally tweeted something hours and hours later, there are reports of people inside the building saying he's saying to go home. They would have listened to him. Most of the dozen people I spoke to wanted to be on background, quoted anonymously. Why? They were concerned about their jobs. Uh, one said that they were concerned Trump would be elected again. Another person said he just didn't want to put up with the misery of being attacked for going publicly. But these are all quotes from them. Uh, one said, this is a senior Republican who is an ally of Trump, quote, I thought there was only one person who could stop it, and that was the president. And from a very senior former Trump administration official, quote, he failed at being president. Now, I'm going to be honest on that note. I want names. Um, because, again, it's it's I know a lot of people are probably wondering, well, why do why are we even going over this? Because. I mean, if you look at the evidence, Trump is responsible. Trump is responsible for inciting that mob that decided to storm the Capitol, that decided to, you know, try to stop an election election count. He's responsible. And that the people around him know that he's responsible. And for the simple fact of the matter, that he needs to account for it. Now, even though he calls himself Teflon Don, who is still dodging lawsuits at this very moment and yet somehow, somehow still able to make campaign rallies. The whole idea of the insurrection, the whole idea of the January 6th commission is to show that, yes, that Trump was responsible and those that collude with him should be held responsible as well. It's just that simple. But it's amazing that we are still fighting that same fight of getting people to understand that, that, yes, there was an attempted coup by domestic terrorists that were all wearing red MAGA hats. You're calling all domestic terrorists Trump supporters? 85% of them, yeah. But moving right along, guys, again, I did want to cover the odds of shooting, obviously, with the Uvalde shooting. Um, President Biden did actually come forward and did speak to the nation about gun laws, about uh, gun reform, and even exactly some gun laws for the Protect Our Kids Act. And, of course, after that, unfortunately, there were more shootings. But first, the president. This past Monday, Jill and I visited Arlington National Cemetery. As we entered those hallowed grounds, we saw rows and rows of crosses among the rows of headstones with other emblems of belief, honoring those who paid the ultimate price on battlefields around the world. The day before, we visited Uvalde, Uvalde, Texas. In front of Robb Elementary School, we stood before 21 crosses for 19 third and fourth graders and two teachers. Standing there in that small town, like so many other communities across America, I couldn't help but think there are too many other schools, too many other everyday places that have become killing fields, battlefields here in America. They had one message for all of us. Do something. Just do something. For God's sake, do something. After Columbine, after Sandy Hook, after Charleston, after Orlando, after Las Vegas, after Parkland, nothing has been done. More kids than soldiers killed by guns. For God's sake, how much more carnage are we willing to accept? How many more innocent American lives must be taken before we say enough, enough? For so many of you at home, I want to be very clear. 
This is not about taking away anyone's guns. It's about not about vilifying gun, o- gun owners. In fact, we believe we should be treating responsible gun owners as an example of how every gun owner should behave. I respect the culture and the tradition and the concerns of lawful gun owners. At the same time, the Second Amendment, like all other rights, is not absolute. Here's what the families in Buffalo and Uvalde in Texas told us we must do. We need to ban assault weapons in high-capacity magazines. And if we can't ban assault weapons, then we should raise the age to purchase them from 18 to 21. Strengthen background checks. Enact safe storage law and red flag laws. Repeal the immunity that protects gun manufacturers from liability. Address the mental health crisis, deepening the trauma of gun violence and as a consequence of that violence. I support the bipartisan efforts that include small group of Democrats and Republican senators trying to find a way. But my God, the fact that the majority of the Senate Republicans don't want any of these proposals even to be debated or come up for a vote, I find unconscionable. My fellow Americans, enough. Enough, it's time for each of us to do our part. It's time to act for the children we've lost, the children we can save, for the nation we love. Let's hear the call and the cry. Let's meet the moment. Let us finally do something. God bless the families who are hurting. So, yeah, that was an excerpt as far as from his speech. It was actually a little over 20 minutes long. But it's amazing that he pointed out the very few things that are in the Protect Our Kids Act. Again, raising the age of uh, raising the age of from 18 to 21 uh, for semi-automatic hang for semi-automatic weapons, for actually introducing red laws, which basically um, if there is a hint of disturbance or a disturbed individual has access to firearms, those firearms can be pulled from said person to actually institute background checks. Because a lot of people are under some, under, some, under this assumption that background checks are done everywhere. They're not. Background checks are not done with personal sales. They're not done with gun trade knife show sales, gun knife trade show sales. They're not. Argue with your mama. They're not. I can tell you off the bat from going to going to a gun and knife trade shows um, in Tennessee, background checks are not being done there. So anybody that has money and ID can go to those trade shows. Bingo, bango. As long as you have an ID and you have money, you can buy a firearm. No background checks are done there. If you're selling privately, again, no background checks are being done. They're trying to close the loopholes to make it harder for those who are going to break the law to get guns. So, but again, a lot of people are going to sit and say, well, law-abiding citizens don't break the laws. Criminals don't follow laws. Well, if you haven't noticed, the last couple of mass shootings were not done by criminals. They were done by individuals who bar- who purchased those guns legally in laws that looses, especially Texas, that has one of the loosest gun laws in the country. Um, but again... Don't blame me. If you listen to most Repul- mostly conservatives and Republicans, they'll be the first ones to shout out quickly, but what about Chicago? Chicago has the strictest gun laws, and yet they have the highest crime rate. Republicans, like I said before, Chicago's their Benghazi. They will never let it go. But here's the one thing I wanted to point out, though. It is amazing that in the UK and Australia, New Zealand, um, and Japan, all have had shootings. All have instituted restricted, highly rigid, highly rigid uh, guidelines and requirements for owning firearms, or just banning firearms outright. Every one of these nations implemented this, and yet have had no mass shootings. America is the only country in the world that has mass, that still has mass shootings still on a global scale. We are literally nine to one to any other country that has mass shootings. Why? Because we have a gun problem. And homosexuals don't like the status quo because that means things have to change. And they should change. Why? Because very shortly after Joe Biden, uh, President Joe Biden gave that speech on gun reform, there was two shootings that were done in less than 48 hours, especially this one right here. Um, there was actually a shooting in Iowa to where uh, two women were, two uh, cautions were shot to death by a man who had a 9 millimeter handgun. Again, this was a domestic dispute, and yet this person decided to shoot two women, and almost and I almost would have shot a third, but the third one got away unharmed. 
That was just in that was honestly in Ames, Iowa. In Tulsa, Tulsa, uh, basically a man who decided to blame a doctor for pain after surgery decided to go on a shooting rampage. Again, I can't make this up. A shooting at an Oklahoma hospital. Police say the gunman targeted a doctor who he blamed for his back pain following surgery. ABC News senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky and ABC's Alex Frische joining us now. Aaron, police now have this letter that the suspect, the suspected gunman had on him. It clearly indicated he was seeking revenge against this doctor. Well, it does, Kira, and the gun he used in this shooting allegedly was purchased very, very recently, but there is no waiting period to purchase a firearm in Oklahoma. And so the, the incident went from some kind of an idea about uh, targeting this doctor because he wasn't happy with the outcome of the surgery, according to police, uh, to buying the gun to then carrying out the shooting. It all unfolded w within just a matter of, of days. And this is yet another a mass shooting in the country where we see something that is not necessarily uh, hatched out well in advance, uh, like a, an intricate plot, but rather something that, that seems to be more spontaneous, even if we later find out there may have been signs in advance that something like this could have happened. Yeah, that, that's right, Aaron. These different kinds of American mayhem, this is a targeted revenge killing, essentially, and he killed other people while doing it. Uvalde, something darker, different, newer, and, and there is a plague of that as well. All of it related to this, this plague of gun violence in America. So Alex, how has the White House responded to this latest mass shooting? Well, Terry, so we know that there is going to be a primetime address. The president will once again tonight uh, push for what he calls common sense gun reforms. And we know uh, that his position on this has been uh, pretty consistent, although as these latest talks about gun reform or gun legislation, uh, he's kind of left it to Congress to, to negotiate and, and try to come to some sort of bipartisan agreement. He's, he's been criticized and, and questioned about whether or not he will insert himself uh, uh, and so I think once again tonight, we're going to hear him again make make that call. But you guys had that map up here uh, at the beginning of the show, just laying out some of the recent violence. Uh, you know, the Gun Violence Archive is one of the sources that we often use when tracking uh, a lot of these shootings. Tulsa is now the 20th mass shooting, according to them, since Uvalde. And since the beginning of this year, there have been 8,085 gun-related deaths. We've got 233 mass shootings, and included in that are hundreds, I mean hundreds of deaths involving children and teens. Aaron, let's talk about these four victims. We talked about Michael Lewis's doctor. Okay, so let's just stop right there because it is pretty much go into um, the reason why he went after it, which they've already sat there and said. Now, granted, you, now granted, Again, you've all happened where a person decided just be, just be fun to go shoot up a school uh, in Iowa, where a person thought he needed to defend himself and shooting two victims. And now in Tulsa, because of the issues he had with the physician, a man took it upon himself to purchase a firearm on that very same day and use it. And this is the problem I have because a lot of this, guys, is with gun culture. And blame the RA for a lot of it. But again, the NRA basically used that along with the Dickey Amendment that makes it hard to look into these studies when it comes to guns, when it comes to mental health and how it actually affects us as Americans. All of that was put into place and none of it was being looked into because, again, Republicans will always block everything. And not just Republicans, some Democrats too. Some Democrats are purchased by the NRA, are bought and paid for by the NRA. But all of GOP, they all tow that party line, even more so that when it comes to the common sense laws, the GOP is still fighting them on the Protect Our Kids Act, which is why everybody's like, well, I want, well, Biden should be able to do something. Here's the thing that a lot of people do not understand. Being the president does not make you a tyrant. You don't get to sit there and say, and this is the thing, that's because the people saw what Donald Trump did. Well, well Trump said he was going to do this and he got this done. Really? Where's the wall that he said Mexico would pay for? Yeah. At the same time, it's like he, the president is not just a guy that can snap his fingers and things move. The president, Biden, Biden can himself cannot sit there and say, OK, I decree that, you know, all assault, all assault, type, all assault uh, style weapons are banned. He can't do that. Why? The Constitution, the balance and checks of power. 
It takes Congress to go ahead and do that. And right now, all of Congress will not agree. So the whole thing about bipartisanship, bipartisan, uh, bipartisanship really doesn't jive very well because the GOP is in the position of we don't have to do anything and still make it harder for you guys to win the midterm election. Again, it's three months, three months and counting, guys. Shit's getting real. GOP does not have to do anything except pretty much say no to what the Democrats are doing. And then from there, politely turn around and tell their voters, who are usually misinformed or watch Fox News, and say the Democrats have done nothing. And the fact of the matter is that Biden has done nothing, or Biden's old, and the fact that they're being the liberals are just trying to give everything away free, you know, all the conservative classics they always like to say. And the crazy thing about it is their voters will believe it. Because why? Their actual constituents, the actual people that they vote in, act like this on gun reform. And again, can't make this up. So this gun would be banned. I hope the, the gun, gun is not loaded. I'm at my house. I can do whatever I want with my gun. Right here in front of me, I have a Sig Sauer P226. Comes with a 21 round magazine. This gun would be banned. And don't let them fool you that they are not attempting to take away your ability to purchase handguns. If you're not here for the children, why don't you go to the funeral of the killer? We're here to get things done and protect our kids. What's your job? People on the other side of the aisle come in and accuse Republicans of being complicit in murder and that we put our right to kill over others' right to live you think we don't have hearts? Your ideas have been shown to get people killed. Now, right there, that's crazy, isn't it? That again, you that's that's during a judiciary committee during the discussion over a gun violence bill that a Republican decides from his home, hey, this is the gun that could be this is the gun that could possibly be banned. Why in the world would any common sense person, let alone a gun owner, sit there and say, hey, this type of gun will be banned on the new law? Because it can because it's a high, it's active, because it's got a high carrying they have a high capacity carry magazine. Or this gun will be banned because it's a bump stock. And I'm just thinking to myself, I was with the I was with the guy who was like, I don't know, guns ain't loaded. Oh, it's in my house. I'm in my house. I can do whatever I want. See, whenever I hear that happen with gun owners, I'm not gonna lie, that makes me person spoke in support oh, of sorry. I'm sorry. But when I, when I hear a person who's responsible going around and turn around and be like, that's my house, I can do whatever I want. That is scary. To me, that's like a concealed carry person that's saying, trust me, I'm trained. No, I don't trust you. I don't trust concealed carry. But I don't trust concealed carry because you know why? Because those concealed carry people are not always going to make the best decision nine times out of ten. I don't care how much you train. I don't care how disciplined you think you are. Because whenever you're introducing a gun into a live environment, you are basically you are you are basically a liability. You are that can lead to something else. But to see Republicans, and this is what Republicans do, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's hard to be wrong about Republicans in this case. Republicans sit there and said, "You guys think," and he said, "You think we put our right to kill above children?" All right, let's look at the facts, shall we? Um, Sandy Hook talked about a bill. Republicans shut it down. Parkland talked about a bill. Republicans shut it down. Every mass shooting that has occurred before Parkland, Columbine, again, uh, law was shot. Again, bill was shot down. The point I'm making is that every time there's been a mass shooting, 
Republicans don't brace for the for the loss of life. They brace for the we're going to have to talk about gun reform again because they know aside from the Dickey Amendment, they know they are sitting on that ace in the hole. The Dickey Amendment prevents the CDC from getting any federal funding to actually look into gun violence and how it actually how to actually prevent it. Even though President Obama tried to actually allocate funds, the fact that the fact that once bills were passed, once budgets were passed and approved for, funding never got there. And Republicans are going to sit there and say, you don't think we have hearts? No, your hearts are bought by the NRA. That's why you'll never hear, I was like, hearing a Republican talk about gun reform is also hearing a Republican say, you know what, we really weren't found in a Christian nation. We really need to stop bringing Christ into it. You'll never hear it. But you'll always hear, oh, you're gonna, they're going to try to take away our guns. They're going to try to take your white to own guns. No. And this is the myth. This is the myth I want to dispel so bad before moving on. No matter what happens in this country, we are beyond the we are beyond the pale of your guns being taken away from you, uh, guns taken away from you on a large scale. Now, unless you are truly a danger to others and it's been founded, then yes, your guns should be taken away from you. But this whole thing that you think the government's going to come door to door and looking for firearms is such a patriotic wet dream for for Republicans that they have to believe it's real because that's the only way they get turned on. And that's very creepy to say, but how true of a statement that is, that they will never introduce gun laws, which is why, again, we're three months and three months and counting, three months and less, three months and counting away from midterms, why you will see no action on the Republicans part. Because you know why? We would have had the George Floyd Police Reform Bill if that was the case. We would have actually had the National Voting Rights Act in place, the John Lewis Act in place. We didn't would have all those things in place. But inaction is what the GOP does when it's a bill that does not benefit those who pay them. Case in point. But speaking of guns, especially with the whole idea, a bill has actually came in in Ohio, and I still cannot believe it's still there. But then again, stuff like this you can't make up. That they, people believe arming teachers is the best way to stop school shootings. And the bill right now is in Ohio. Just one person spoke in support of arming teachers, the legislative director of the Buckeye Firearms Association. I believe in giving our kids a fighting chance when the police aren't in the room yet and seconds are going by that I'd rather my kids have the chance someone will protect them than to be sitting ducks like we saw this past week in that tragedy. After that, it was a parade of teachers, parents, and union leaders who say more guns in school is not the answer to the problem. Instead, we are shifting the narrative to talk about good guys with guns and bad guys with guns. Jerry Obrensky with the Ohio Federation of Teachers says teachers are more than willing to defend their students, but they didn't sign up to be law enforcement officers. Teachers shielded those children with their bodies. We are willing to do that. We do that every day. We do not want to have to determine whether or not we shoot one of our kids who has a gun. The bill would institute 24 hours of training for teachers. That's more training than for the soon to be obsolete conceal and carry law, but much less than for police officers, which is the standard the Ohio Supreme Court recently set for teachers to carry. I talked to Eric Delbert, a law enforcement officer and an instructor at a local firearm store. He's in favor of armed teachers, but says 700 hours of police training is more than necessary. The highest minimum number of hours is a good standard to get that up as much as possible. Obviously, 700 hours was way above and beyond, um, but I think I think 20 is a good start. So again, the fact that at a discussion for in Ohio, one person who was just a part of the federal, who was part of the firearms committee, was all for it. Every teacher was like, no, hell no. And I always said this best. It's amazing what people want to arm teachers, but you also, I like the same teachers that you sat there and said that, that they can't talk about gay people, that they can't talk about LGBTQ, that they can't teach certain books because it makes your kids feel bad, but you want to arm them. <laughs> I'm like, the only thing you should be arming teachers with is more pay, more resources, and above all else, security for schools. But arming them is not going to work. And I don't blame teachers for what they say. This will actually probably lead to a mass exodus of teachers leaving 
if they attempt to do this. It is completely asinine. We should not be asking teachers to arm themselves when you won't even give a teacher support to actually teach your help to teach your child. That's the wild part. You won't even give support to a teacher to actually educate your child, but you want to empower the teacher and say, here, here's a gun, protect my child. It is so beyond stupid, and it's only being fueled by amosexuals. It's being fueled by those whose love affairs with guns borderline on suspect behavior. Call me if I'm wrong, but I don't blame those teachers for what they're doing, and hopefully it gets shot down. But to other news, again, um, we do talk about Biden, especially in his uh, ideas of student loan forgiveness. It was announced that he did actually, the, the administration did announce um, on Wednesday that the uh, they would forgive $5.8 billion federal dollars, excuse me, they would forgive $5.8 billion in federal student loans for students who went to schools that were associated with Corinthian colleges. Um, this will probably erase the debt for about 560,000 borrowers who were enrolled in colleges like Everest, Herald, and Wyotech, who Corinthian owned and operated, but again, um, falsified degrees and basically took federal funded money. Now, I keep saying this all the time, that the more that we forgive, or I should say the more that the Biden administration forgives debt loans, because again, those those colleges, if you're wondering, those colleges were basically uh, collapsed after uh, the education department found out that they were faulty and withholding funds back in 2005, 2015. But the thing I'm saying is, that's just, I mean, forget the fact that he's already forgiven student loans uh, for public for public self-loans, as far as public, public, excuse me, public servant loans that he forgiven for. He also forgave loans for disabled students. And now you're forgiving loans for those that went to these schools and got swiss and they got they got bamboozled and they're basically their federal funding taken from and that they, they were left on the hook. If this is not a case for just clearing out student debt, I don't know what is. You can't keep, you can't, I mean, the thing about, I will say this, Democrats, and I say this about, I say President Biden, because again, he can make an executive order to basically forgive total student debt and leave it up to the Democrats to sit there and actually fight for it. But getting Manchin and Cinema on board is going to be a pain in the butt, which is going to make that a, almost damn near impossible. But what we, we do know what is possible is that student loan forgiveness, total student loan forgiveness can actually happen. And the fact that if it does happen, will be the biggest, and I'm still calling this, if student loan, if total student loan forgiveness went into effect as of to, as of Monday, the economical boom that would happen as folks realize that their credit profiles have just would have just increased for the better would probably be the biggest economical boom since the beginning of the New Deal. I'm just gonna call it like it is. But again. Biden and Biden Democrats need a win. Yes, you got it. You got in the first. You got in a black woman on the Supreme Court. You got in a black woman on the federal board of governors. You got in a woman. You got in a woman um, in one of the highest offices in the Navy. Yes, all great brownie points. The problem is in the in the win columns that lead to the election, you don't have a lot there. And I said it best: Biden could win. Biden and Democrats could win this midterm in a landslide. If they do one of two things, they have two paths. One, decriminalize marijuana and expunge all records of those that had marijuana related offenses, which again, probably won't happen because everybody believes the marijuana is the war on drugs, which is bullshit. Or number two, forgive the toll student loan debt of the country. In doing one of those two things, you have guaranteed the fact that you would have total control of Congress for the next two years of your presidency. Will Biden do either one of them? I'm more. I would say so. I would say student debt because he doesn't want to touch marijuana because some still some people believe that you know potheads are a bad thing. Yet, ask Colorado, New Jersey, and the other eight states that have made marijuana legal, and ask them how they're faring in the economical world. Because last time I checked, California's not broke. But I digress. Moving right along, guys. Again, I'm talking about the job board, and this is the reason why I sit here and say that you should never that corporate loyalty is bullshit. When you have idiots, billionaire idiots, I won't say billionaire, he's not an idiot, he's a billionaire, but let's just say he won in the birth lottery. Elon Musk is doing this because he has a bad feeling the job market's going to crash.
is giving Tesla employees an ultimatum, either return to the office or quit. An email sent to employees, Musk said they need to show up for at least 40 hours of work per week or the company will assume that they have resigned. CNBC breaking business reporter Rob Weil has been studying this and following this for a while. Uh, Rob, this is happening at a time when, when a lot of tech companies are actually going the opposite direction. They are embracing remote work or, or a hybrid work system. So why is, is Musk sort of bucking the trend here? That's right. Well, that's what he does. He bucks the trend in, in most aspects. So this is pretty unique among tech companies. Most notably, it actually runs counter to what Twitter, the company he's made a bid for, uh, recently told its employees, which is that they can all work from home. So this is another Musk, um, just kind of him doing his own thing. It was addressed to everyone, as you note, um, which means engineers and, um, uh, you know, we'll call them C-suite or, or white collar folks at Tesla. Um, but this is just sort of what he does. He likes to um, take things into his own hands and zig when everyone is zagging. All I can sit there and say is what they usually say, tell me you're trying to lay off workers without trying to say you're taking out laying off workers. Because again, they, he's already pausing hiring and because he still owns Tesla. He has, unfortunately, his, his deal with Twitter is on hold, but he's still $46 billion richer. But he said he had a super bad feeling about the economy and decides that, oh, you have to come in and work from home. Oh, we're hiring all, we're free, we're putting a hiring freeze for the foreseeable future. And that he's considering about cutting 10% of his workforce. Guys, I have said this all the time, all the time, and I will not stop saying it. There is no such thing as corporate loyalty. They will cut you and say it's a great business idea while you leave and they call you a bad employee. They do not care. I'll say it once and I'll say it again. Companies, if you died on the job, the job opening for where you used to work will be posted faster than your obituary. I will always say that. That's why I keep telling you guys when it comes down to it, do what is best for you. If you can work at companies like Tesla, if that's your dream, cool. But understand, they will cut you if it benefits them. And that's the reason why a lot of people are finding it very hard. I, I haven't actually, not to go on a rant, but a lot of people find it very hard to work. I'm going to tell you why. Because there's no reward in working hard anymore. I mean, people are seeing that. I mean, we are kind of in that burnout stage where you're just going through the motions of work. There's no reward for you to work harder, as in the sense that there is no punishment if you decide to reduce your work or do nothing because you're kind of in that limbo area. So along with that and the possibility of pay not being increased, companies can sit there and say, we're hiring all the time. Currently right now, there's 11.4 million jobs. 11.4 million jobs out there, all unfulfilled. I wonder why. Maybe because the fact that, the, maybe the fact like say for instance in Tennessee, there's hiring jobs, they're, they're hiring everywhere, but at nine, at 10, Highest being $15 an hour, mostly in the service industry, fast food and things of that nature. Who can work off $15 an hour? Who can work off $9 an hour? Who can work off $10 an hour? Not when the average median income, especially in Tennessee, is barely anywhere between, uh, what, twenty seven to 42000 That's the average median income. Less than 10% of Tennessee is actually above 70% in salary. That alone should tell you something that there's a wage income gap problem. And companies are saying that nobody wants to work. Everybody wants to work. Everybody has realized they're tired of busting their ass for peanuts when you can obviously pay more because every corporation out there, including oil companies, just to exclude them because they're making record profits, but everyone else, meat processing like Tyson, um, Abbott, baby formula like Abbott, all are recording record profits in a pandemic area. They can sit there and say, nobody wants to work. I said, no, companies don't want to pay. And that's the reason why jobs will go unfulfilled. But again, corporate loyalty is bullshit. Moving right along, guys, a couple stories we get before we get to our feel-good segment. Again, you would think in the middle of Pride Month that, you know, it would just be nice for the simple fact of the matter that we could actually have a month that's dedicated to a certain group of individuals to be recognized and to be included in the conversation. However, North Carolina has decided to enter the Hold My Beer contest and decided that um, there is a bill that is being submitted to North Carolina's uh, classrooms 
uh, excuse me, that's, that's going to be submitted, and it's based on the fact of a parental bill of rights. Uh, yes, you heard it, a parental bill of rights. Why? Because it matches what Florida's parental bill of rights is, also known as the Don't Say Gay Bill, which currently has cleared the Senate um, in North Carolina, and it's currently now heading to the House of, Rep House of Representatives, which currently has a Republican majority. Even though Roy Cooper is actually a Democrat who has sat there and said that he has spoken against the bill and will veto it, which means it will still go back to the House to be voted on again. And if it was voted in mature, if it was voted in majority, then that bill becomes law, which we all know what the Parental Bill of Rights is. It's bullshit. It is basically trying to silence the fact of the matter that, yes, that there are going to be people that are different from you. And they'll try to sit there and say, well, this will this will turn children or this will hurt children. No, it won't. Don't believe me. Kids have been reading Captain Underpants for years, and I've yet to see one dude go around drawing tra la la. I've yet to see that happen. We've been reading the Bernstein Bears, and I've yet to see well, there is a furry thing, but that's different. That's not that's not related to this. Um I mean, but you know, you don't see them reading certain books. It's like, well, it's a book about uh it's a book about ants. Or it's a book about green eggs and ham. Or it's a book about Horton Hears a Who. And all of those fun books that we love to read. And yet kids have not been turned to the dark side. But you think talking about LGBTQ plus is going to affect children. Y'all, I hate to say it, but Republicans, ultra conservatives, and repressed Christians and repressed religious people have realized that they are no longer happy with the fact that not everybody lives the way they want to. They believe they're support. They they believe they're superiorly. Uh, they believe that they're morally superior and want to force their way on someone. Amazing, the party of small government is actually using government to put everybody else under their way of under their way of life. It's like misery loves company. But again, um, we'll follow that as it follows. As we said before, it is headed to the House of Representatives for voting. Um, but the government has said that he would veto it, which means that if it was voted on again in a two thirds majority, unfortunately, becomes law. Um, but the last one I got, guys, before we get to our feel good segment again, I don't know if you'll remember this story about the uh, officers that shot into a parked car because the man said that they saw that saw the, the uh, man in the car had a gun. Well, they decided to come back with a preliminary report and they have sat there and said that the officer who killed the black man sitting in the parked car will not face charges. <sighs> Look, all I can sit there and say is this was their video explaining why no charges will be filed. long investigation. Special prosecutors Tim Greinke and Scott Hansen say the key piece of evidence is the dash camera video. It shows Jay Anderson Jr., who was previously asleep in his car, drop his hand towards a gun former Wauwatosa police officer Joseph Mensa says was in the front seat. Whether or not you think Mensa is a liar or not a liar, the dash camera is is showing what actually happened and that was and that is what informs whether or not a reasonable person in his position uh, would have thought he, he had to shoot first to save himself there was no body camera video wabatosa police didn't have them at the time and there was no audio recording of the conversation between mensa and anderson before the shooting special prosecutors say an officer moved the gun before investigators could process the scene it was a mistake to move that gun before it was photographed because you want to know exactly where the gun was and what the position of it was and another argument for body cam in their report, the special prosecutors say Milwaukee police didn't record any of their interviews with witnesses, saying it wasn't their policy. Oh, this notion that we're going to interview people in connection with a police shooting and a, someone's dead and not bother to record the interview is completely ridiculous. The special prosecutor suggests the State Department of Justice should investigate all police-involved shootings, or at least form a new statewide investigating agency for this purpose. A bipartisan bill for this failed to pass this spring. But there's no accountability. It's like there's a million things they did wrong with this investigation. It's like, oh, well, you know, it's just the investigation was just a bad investigation. In a statement, Mensa's attorney says Mensa has been cleared in multiple investigations now and thanks anyone who showed him support. In Milwaukee, Stephanie Haynes. Man, ain't that crazy? They said, they try to stand and say that there will be no charges filed. And keep in mind what they said. No body cam, no audio, 
no recorded conversation between the 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 deceased and the officer who shot but all you have is a dash cam that looks like that looks like you're watching pixelated porn from the 1990s and yet no charges will be filed even though they said that they even though they said that the evidence was tampered with that the gun that the gun the gun in the car was moved even though they said that there was no evidence of them talking to witnesses even though that they said well this makes the case for body cameras how else do you scream police cover up? How else? Because yes, we do know in the court of public opinion, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. And who better to beat the law system than a bunch of corrupt cops? And I'm not saying they're corrupt, but again, when the only evidence that you have is the fact of a dash cam and not the officer wearing a camera and just not canvassing evidence and the fact of a tampered, uh, tampered uh, gun, I'm like, this screams cover-up. But they wonder why we keep on saying defund the police. They wonder why we keep on saying police reform needs to happen. They wonder why we keep on saying um, that the um, fraternal order police needs to be held accountable. It's the re- There's, It's not a crazy reason why we say it. It's a reason why we say it, because it needs to be done, especially in situations like this, where she was exactly right. They will sit there and look at it and be like, oh, well, they're going to treat this as, you know what, it's not a big deal, you know, oops, things happen. And that is the reason why I keep saying F the police, because the police and the court laws and everything else is really designed to, design to protect them. It's not designed to actually protect people. And as we, you've seen at Uvalde, they're not exactly out to protect and serve themselves when their own lives are in danger. But that being said, guys, we're going to move to our feel-good segment because usually how the fact we got here, we do cover a lot of things that are doom and gloom, sometimes make you lose your faith in humanity. But, hey, it's the weekend. Hopefully it's good and sunny where you're at. Uh, we will leave you guys out with some good vibes and uh, trying to, you know, make you smile, make you feel happy, make you think like, you know, hey, it's not all bad. Um, I did actually play it during the midweek review, but I still want to play it again about a former NICU patient who's returning back to the same NICU as a doctor now. My mother and my father would recount my birth story and how I was in the NICU and my dad would say, I was so small that I fit in the, in, in the palm of his hand. solidified my interest early on because I was introduced to this uh, combined BSMD program in high school. Shadowing uh, neonatologists at my local NICU during my summers in high school. That is what uh, really piqued my interest and then solidified my interest in wanting to go into medicine. And right now I'm pursuing uh, a residency in pediatrics because that was the one field of medicine that I was exposed to during the summer. And with my own personal background, I have uh, developed a natural affinity towards the field. And again, that's cool. I love seeing stories where, you know, you come full circle. That a preemie that is now actually about to be a full-fledged doctor is about to be able to serve back in the same neonatal unit that he once started out at. It's like going full circle. I like that. Uh, the next story I got, guys, again, I always believe in the fact of history. I do love history. I believe the the, the, the truest, honest form of history uh, should be actually educated to people. So that way, if we know about our history, we can actually avoid the pitfalls of previous generations. And in this case, Black history is always and should be celebrated and recommended for all to see. Exhibit with a lesson. Well, this is to show how Black people and Black cultures are integral to the making of the modern world. Curator Kenitra Fletcher is describing Afro-Atlantic histories, a new collection at the prestigious National Gallery of Art in Washington. What's the importance of having this art in this building, given how different it is to everything else? We want um, people to understand that work by Black diasporic people is just as um, treasured and important as the European art that you see in the other galleries in this building. 
more than 130 works meant to take viewers through a global journey from slavery to emancipation to the modern fight for civil rights and equality. This is the key image of the exhibition. And in this work, they've taken on the guise of the Statue of Liberty. They're thinking about uh, citizenship and sovereignty and who gets to represent nations. Often it's not a black person. A message that resonates with young artists from the Duke Ellington School of the Arts. How did you feel walking through the exhibit? I felt empowered. I felt like I was seen, I was heard. When you go to like a regular museum, I don't see other artists that are like me. And why is that important to see a black artist that represents you? Because it shows that like, I can do the same thing. It's something I can achieve. The art also made them think about the national battle raging over teaching race and history. A lot of people want to erase history and this kind of doesn't let that happen. If you know anything about it is that art survives. Um, and this art will survive and it will prevail. A powerful message amid powerful art. Yami Shal Sendor. Again, they're exactly right. Art can tell us art and tell a story too, right along with history. And again, I think it's just cool that you know younger generations get to see this and feel empowered and feel educated. And that is the entire point. Just saying. Anyway, like fishing? I don't. I personally do. I personally believe if you're going to fish, you might as well fish for good stuff. But there are lessons that can be taught in fishing, especially with trying to connect with kids. And this young man and this man has found a way to do that through his love of fishing and be able to connect with kids and uh, hopefully empower their lives for the better. And holy mackerel moment has turned into a passion for teaching kids to fish, especially when they have no one else to take them. Sam Brock with tonight's Inspiring America. Under perfectly formed clouds in St. Cloud, Florida, a group of young fishermen guided by Big Will Dunn. Oh, that's a nice one. Give me five, man. <laughs> reel in a little slice of heaven. Oh, nice fish, man. What is your favorite part about this whole experience? Favorite part? I'd definitely just say the fight between me and the fish. The children here participating in Take a Kid Fishing, Inc. have either lost their father or don't have an active father figure. And few things hit harder than that. What was your relationship with your dad like? Like a beautiful bond. My dad's phenomenal dad. So Dunn started mentoring yeah, kids floor, missing floor that relationship. Feet. Hold up your fish, everybody. <laughs> Woo! Look at all these Max. Dunn says he was first inspired by a boy living next door whose father wasn't around. My philosophy is just for one more. And I thought if I would help just as one more kid, but it's got a lot much bigger than one more. Since then, thousands of kids have become hooked. Nice catch. Including 12-year-old Jaden Pryor. It's nice to have someone that's got your back, right? Yeah. All the time. And he does that for so many other, other guys yeah. too. Yeah, just to think like what he's doing is amazing. Is he changing lives? Definitely. Multiple at a time. Dunn may not fill the void of dad, <laughs> but the connection certainly feels just keep reeling. An awful yeah, lot don't go, like don't family. Go there you go. All right. <laughs> Sam Yee. Brock, NBC News. I thought that was cool too, because again, you know, you don't have, you don't have to be the role of dad. I've always said this best. You don't actually have to be a dad uh, to be effective. I mean, I, you can sit there and say, especially when you're mentoring kids that aren't your own, you don't have to be a father figure. You just simply have to be an example. The rest will take care of itself. Um, but that's just my two cents on it. But anyway, that's going to do it for this podcast, guys. So I do thank you. I do thank everybody that liked, that watched, that shared, that let people know this was live. I certainly appreciate that. Um, some shameless plugs before we do get out of here, guys. Of course, um, shout out to the guys over at RA Geeks and Geeks Out for allowing me to share my podcast on their page. You can definitely find them on Facebook as well as YouTube at RA Geeks and Geeks Out. Also, shout out to my buddy Vaughn, Aiden Vaughn Westwood on Facebook, Big Busy Aiden on socials. You can definitely find his shows that are showing there and new stuff that you can always see under his uh, socials. Big BZA dot on TikTok, on IG, as well as YouTube. So definitely check him out um, as well. As far as yours truly, guys, Blackbox447 is still my handle on Instagram. You can definitely follow me there. I usually post reviews of movies, video games, television shows, and gym stuff because I do a couple push-ups. At the same time, guys, I'm all about positivity and moving people forward and just try and do things different, you know, trying to encourage not only myself but others because we all need that encouragement. We all need compassion. We all need kindness. So simply put, just simply be kind. It takes zero energy to be nice. It takes everything you need to be a dick. But again, you don't know what people are going through, what battles they're fighting. So simply you being kind, just simply saying hello or just checking on them 
can do so much more than just giving them a smile. You could possibly save a life. Aside from that, guys, coronavirus is still around, even though numbers are going down. And, of course, the weather is out and we all want to be outside. But let's protect ourselves in busier areas with a mask and also try to avoid those who are sick. And if you are sick, trying to also isolate yourself as well. Just because we're not talking about coronavirus doesn't mean it hasn't went anywhere. We still need to be prevalent. We still need to be protected. We still need to be forward thinking. Uh, and, of course, uh, guys, the last thing I'll say about how the fact we got here, it's all about staying informed. We're not trying to change minds or reinvent the wheel. We're simply giving you all the information that we'll inform you with, as well as to provide a logical perspective for you to make your mind up with. Um, we do a lot of better society. We're informed. We move forward. We, we move forward. We try to right our wrongs of our past by making decisions now that we should have done back then, like electing our first black woman Supreme Court justice to electing a black woman to the, first, uh, to the board of the Federal Reserve of Governors and also having our first commander in the Navy as a woman. Uh, when we don't learn from when we don't learn from our mistakes. We don't learn from history. We are doomed to repeat it. That's why we keep asking ourselves all the time, why does everything still go up by our paychecks? Why are we electing different politicians with still the same old game in Congress? And most importantly, how the fact we got here. Thank you all for watching. And again, if you want to, if you have any opinions on anything we talked about, guys, please comment. I still want to know and again, basically continue the conversation. Take care of yourselves and each other, and we will all get through this. Peace.